All right, Paul, we just saw <laughs> something that does most people brains in, and that is frequency allocation. It, and it kind of seems like a problem, right? All of them are taken and you have to book it so far in advance with your slice. And as it gets lower, you need more technology. So how do we actually even do it at all? Yeah, so let's imagine you want to put up a new direct broadcast yep. TV satellite. Uh, you might have to buy a spectrum allocation. These cost billions of dollars. Yes. There are auctions the government's hold That's regularly right. for these things. Um, there's only a limited number of frequencies. Now for ground-based radio, that didn't matter too much. The fact that, for example, uh, a phone company in Finland wants to use the same frequency as a military radar in uh, China, yep. it's not a problem. They've got the world in between. Them. Exactly. But space, you haven't got that. There's space. nothing in between. So how do you avoid interference? I mean, okay. one option is to spend billions of dollars to buy some new frequency that no one else is using, but they're running out pretty fast. That's right. So luckily, we can use antennae. Now, antennae have two things they do. One is, they, because they're very big, they can pick up very faint signals. That's right. So we can boost, essentially, the signal uh, yeah. or recover faint signals further away. So if you had a low-power satellite a long way out on Earth, you wanted to pick up the signal from it, you'd only need a big antenna. That's right. And that's why they build these big ones for talking for spacecraft really, really far away. Yes, but for Earth communication, the most important thing is not that. that that's important, the yep. ability to pick up faint signals. It means you can get away with less energy pack consumption on your spacecraft. But the main benefit is directionality. Ah, uh, okay, yes. So the basic idea is that if you've got an antenna, that means you're going to be able to send signals to and pick up signals from there, but not there. That's right. So these two spacecraft could be using the same frequencies. But they're not going to interfere. As long as they're far enough away that your antenna can just point at one and not the other, mm. then you're not going to have problems. So I guess it's kind of like communication, right? If I'm in a different room, in theory, you're probably not going to hear me. But if we're in the same room, we're going to hear each other's sounds or signals and get that interference. Yes, this allows us to almost like break space up into different areas. Yep. And we only listen to one and not the other. It's yep. like a cone of silence over there and listening to this one. Now, the problem with this is something called diffraction. I mean, yes. radio waves, like any other sort of wave, water waves, sound waves, doesn't always go in a straight line. That's right. So if you get waves and they go through a gap in a wall, mostly they continue going straight along here, but you see they sort of spread out a bit. That's right. And that's called diffraction. And what that means is if I point an antenna at your nose, it's not going to send the signal just to your nose. Some of it will probably miss and hit your eyes and your ears. So the beam will spread out. That's right. And this works both ways. First of all, if you're sending a signal up, it spreads out. But also, it means that anywhere up here, we'll be sensitive. Uh, so if you yeah. made a transmitter on your ear or other ear, I'd still be able to pick it up, even though I'm aiming my antenna at your That's nose. That's right. So you can't be too close. Otherwise, you will still get some interference because that beam will also spread. So you can actually have overlap, and that could be where your interference is. Yeah. So um, the amount of spreading depends on the wavelength of whatever radiation you're using. Okay. The bigger the wavelength, the more it spreads. Oh, yep. And also it depends on how big your dish is. The bigger the dish, the smaller the spread. Okay. So I want a very directional signal going just to the tip of your nose. I need a very big antenna and a very short wavelength. That's right. If I had a very long wavelength and a small antenna... It goes really then, far. Yeah. Okay. So what this means is, it turns out that for the fairly big communication dishes, the ones that are used for sending telephone calls across the Atlantic, yep. they're quite big dishes, which means their beam spreads out by about two degrees. Okay. Which means as long as your other spacecraft is two degrees away... That's right, so you're orbit, not going to be picked up by that. Yeah, That's right. so you've got 360 degrees all the way around geostationary orbit, divide it by two, that means you can get about 180 satellites up there using the same frequency. Using the same frequency, that's right. For this sort of communication, and yeah. you can aim your beam at that one and not that one, mm. and also pick up signals from this one and not that one. That's right. Now, it's worse for direct broadcast TV because the dishes are smaller, because you don't want to have a two-meter dish on everyone's roof. Okay, that's simply really a cost at this point in logistics, right? If yes. you have these giant dishes, well, then direct broadcast TV is really not affordable. Yeah, so with the sort of dishes you typically get, the beam's about nine degrees wide. So that means we can fit only 40, not 120, roughly. Yeah. in that orbit. And if you're over somewhere like Europe or North America, where there are probably a lot of companies that would like to beam TV to you, you really can't fit very many at the same frequency. So that's when you really then get the competition between frequency allocation, because there's just a limit of what you can put there. That's right.